make sure and let us hope that we will be able to address all the problems which are facing us. Let us emulate Comrade Mandela's values, remembering that we are one great nation, that we are stronger, united as one. I thank you, Comrade. Thank you very much, Comrade uh, Tulas, for Tulas Nexi, for highlighting the most important landmarks that brought us on our journey since 1994 to where we are today, but also outlining that we have tasks that must be done and we have challenges that we must face. And we must thank you that you've also given us a view of the legacy of Comrade Nelson Mandela. Ladies and gentlemen, comrades, we are very honored to be joined today by a group of formidable intellectuals and activists whose analysis will assist us to understand the current events, what needs to be done in the context of Mandela's legacy. Our first panel is Ms. Isabel Fry, who is the Director of the Studies in Poverty and Inequality Institute based in Johannesburg. Her background is in law and social policy with a focus on poverty and socioeconomic rights in the South African context. She has been for many years a passionate advocate for a basic income grant and also participates in the community constituency of NEDLAC. She will be followed by Dr. Samadoda Fikeni, recently appointed as a public service commissioner, associate professor to the UNISA, to, UNI, to the UNISA Tabo Mbeki School of Public and International Affairs. And as a political scientist, his in areas of interest include policy analysis, comparative politics, research, methodology, international politics, and political economy and heritage. He is an author, researcher, public speaker, and commentator on a range of local and global political, social, and heritage, as well as economic issues. The youth and younger generation tonight is represented by Ms. Busi Sibeko, a researcher at the Institute for Economic Justice. The IEG has as its stated objective to build a new generation of activist economists, and she certainly fits the bill. Following her is Witz, Associate Professor of International Relations, who we all know as Comrade Vishwa Sadgar, an act activist and left thinker. He is founder of the now, new, the now board of the Co Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center, as well as the co-founder of the Climate Justice Charter process. Professor Monique Marx will, be, uh, will follow thereafter from the Durban University of Technology, head of the Urban Futures Center, activist, and has published a, widely in the areas of youth social movements, police labor relations, police organizational change, and security governance, and is a board member of the Safer South Africa Foundation. Finally, we will be addressed by Professor Billy Ramachopa, who is WITS Medical School Head of Clinical Department and Head Trauma, former president of Azaso, now SASCO, and one of the founders and chairpersons of the Strategic Dialogue Group, a, a forum of former activists from the student movement. We will, uh, our panel will, um, will be in, in, in that order as well. And it will start with uh, Ms. Isabel Fry. Um, please put on your video and unmute yourself as you take the floor. You have between five and seven minutes. Ms. Ms. Fry, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Duarte. And Phoebe, can you run my, there we go. Um, I just want to thank you for the honor of this invitation tonight. It is um, indeed a moment of deep reflection. Uh, and I trust, Mr. President, that my message will, will be able to 
rise and surface a number of critical interventions, which I believe we can and should make. I just, my first slide there just shows yesterday evening, a number of people came together to assist me in deliberating around this. Marcus Norden, a pastor, uh, Brian Kohoro, a Zimbabwean public intellectual, Zola Ntolosi, who I see is here tonight, um, Dominic Peake and two-month-old two Sam, uh, as well as Mark Lubner, who's a leading philanthropist um, and comes from Africa, Tikkun, uh, and Mark Gakarak. And together we came up uh, with a commemoration of what Ubuntu really should mean. So Ubuntu reimagining, reinvigorating, and repurposing Mandela's Ubuntu for 2021. Thank you. So Mr. President, Uh, so I decided instead to, to make it uh, much more palatable. So my first point is that Mandela's vision of Ubuntu needs to be reimagined, re reinvigorated and repurposed for 2021. And that needs to be done by all of us, by Mandela's people. Number two is strengthening state capacity in the Department of Social Development through mobile technology, making sure that the department is inclusive and empowered and reaches all of us who feel sometimes that, we very close, uh, we're, that we're not very close to the state. And thirdly, basic income grant, the bread that brings freedom, as Mandela would say. Thank you. So Mandela's legacy of Ubuntu reimagined, reinvigorated and repurposed for 2021. We need to start having curated national conversations to ask ordinary people what Ubuntu means for me. Uh, one of the ways that we can do this is through NEDLAC, to have a WhatsApp platform using the very successful turn.io uh, platform that's been used by the Ministry of Health recently, have people from across the country, similar to the Freedom Charter, flow through their question, their questions but visions, most importantly, their visions of what Ubuntu can and should mean for them in their reality as citizens of South Africa. Family meetings have become really important for us, but often the message is one of death and danger. Would it not be a much better idea, Mr. President, if we could float some of those messages that come through from ordinary people on the WhatsApp system through their black, saying what Ubuntu can be, reimagining Mandela's legacy for us. And finally, on this initiative, we uh, earlier saw Sela from, Nash, uh, from the Nelson Mandela Foundation. On the 5th of December, on Sunday, the 5th of December this year, there'll be the, national, the annual Nelson Mandela commemorative lecture. Would it not be a fantastic opportunity, Mr. President, for you to launch Ubuntu 2021, the vision and the hope in Mandela's legacy um, at that annual lecture? Thank you. The second point, the Department of Social Development, repurposing the Ubuntu department. In preparation last night, um, both Marcus Norden and Zola were saying that it's important to have a fit for purpose, that we need to go just beyond just the theory, beyond the vision. We need to have a capacitated uh, state that is fit for structure. One of the things about the Department of Social Development is though it should be the department <coughs> that's closest to people. It often isn't. The most incredible idea would be to reach out to people, to have an Ubuntu smartphone, so that everybody is registered, everybody is linked in, and everybody can be connected. So this smartphone can be one that is manufactured and distributed in South Africa. It can be connected. It can have a number, a small suite of functionalities. Google Maps, so I know when my 14-year-old daughter is coming home, we can have an e-wallet uh, on the phone. And that's how social grants can be paid, so that people's dignity is restored and they don't have to wait in long queues. It's the link that brings people to the heart of the state. And what, of course, is the use of a smartphone without data? Uh, what we propose is that the cell phone data companies um, are approached and asked to provide one gigabyte of data free for everybody in South Africa. We know the Competition Commission challenged them. We know that as a result of a number of challenges and applications to that, uh, the full extent and vision of that hasn't happened. We can. We can make sure that government through the Department of Social Development is in every house and every citizen is linked in to the Ubuntu of the state. Next slide. And this takes me to my third point, the basic income grant, the universal humanity of Ubuntu. We know that a basic income grant has been successfully implemented at a state level in Alaska. 
in a provincial level in India and at a national level in Brazil. It's been tried, it's been tested, and it's been perfected. Now imagine, Mr. President, if we introduced a basic income grant of 1,268 indexed to the national poverty line. With one policy, we can eliminate poverty. Can you imagine every night when that basic income grant comes through on a monthly basis, the ping to 50 million phones of the money that comes through, providing the basic floor for us to rebuild where we have come from, from the catastrophic areas uh, where people's livelihoods have been destroyed, where we need to rebuild with nothing. We can rebuild with the basic floor of a basic income grant. The question of financing is one that we have looked at with a number of both economists um, as well as other financial people. And the idea that we have is that the initiation capitalization can come from a financing blend of fiscal and monetary policies to include a one-source solidarity wealth tax, the raising of capital by treasury from the private sector support, a GEPF payment holiday, as well as a reduction of PIC funding by 50%. Multipliers and clawbacks make a universal basic income grant in South Africa sustainable. The question that has to be asked is, what is the cost of not imp implementing a basic income grant? Final. And so, just to recap the next and to look at the next steps, Mr. President, we need to look at reinvigorating and reapplying Ubuntu. We can do that through NEDLAC using the WhatsApp platform with social partners. We can analyze and aggregate people's submissions, a lot like the submissions to the Freedom Charter uh, were collected and collated in the years gone by. Those can come through term.io and those can be broadcast on a regular basis through the Sunday night family meetings and can culminate in the annual Nelson Mandela lecture. Uh, which the president uh, with Cello and the foundation's approval can use to launch the Ubuntu 2021 vision. Secondly, completely revamp the Ministry of Social Development, looking at ways in which we can make sure that this most caring of government departments can be in every person's home, in every person's pocket, and free data needs to ensure that we are all equally included. And finally, Mr. President, on the 9th of August, on Women's Day, you can announce a hope to every woman in this country that um, the introduction of a basic income grant, which will ensure that we all are seen, that we are all validated, and we are all embraced in this amazing nation that has the power to welcome us all back as children of the Rainbow Nation. Thank you very much. Comrade Fry, thank you very, very much for what is certainly thought-provoking, insightful, practical. And um, I'm, I'm sure um, we've all listened very carefully. Um, what, would, what should Ubuntu really mean to all of us? And reimagining uh, re it, reinvigorating it, and repurposing our Ubuntu. Thank you very much, Comrade Fry, for that. Um, comrades, Professor Samadota Fikeni has not as yet logged in. So I'm going to request uh, Comrade Busi Sibeko uh, to, to come to the platform, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me here today. Um, and yeah, so Nelson Mandela was a very complex political figure. Um, we all are complex beings with ideas that change and develop over time. The question is, which Mandela do we choose to remember? Today, I choose to remember the Nelson Mandela that embraced the ANC's Freedom Charter, which included demands such as land to be given to all landless people and living wages and shorter hours of work. The Nelson Mandela who believed that political liberation without economic dispensation does not present um, even a shadow of liberation. Using this definition of liberation, I come to conclude that we are not liberated. South Africa is a non-viable society for the majority. From the beginning of violent colonial extraction, accumulation in South Africa has been built on the exploitation and oppression of the work, Black working class, and specifically the social reproduction of underpaid labor. This structure remains largely the same. While some things have gotten better in education, in health, for example, 
the socioeconomic injustice continues to be reproduced without the change to the socioeconomic conditions which underpin crisis after crisis we will continue to experience social unrest the current economic structure cannot and will not deliver on the goals of the freedom charter South Africa's economic policy has been characterized by attempts to achieve stabilization, liberalization, privatization, and rationalization, as we see with the public sector wage bill currently. The paradigm is that has been that a stable macroeconomic environment, you know, will lead to growth and therefore people will be prosperous. But stability of a macroeconomic environment does not mean that there'll be stability in the social context as we see currently. This model has not created the equal opportunities that Nelson Mandela was once prepared to die for. While the country burns, the commitment to the status quo macroeconomic framework has won above the liberation. In the midst of crisis, there's a strong commitment to austerity, despite the evidence that it exacerbates existing inequalities. The Treasury itself acknowledges that there will be negative impacts on public service provisioning that children in no fee paying schools will be disproportionately impacted by these cuts. This fundamentally goes against our constitution and the Freedom Charter in itself. In the midst of a crisis, most of the emergency measures have ended, leaving business, workers, and households in a state of desperation. While the crisis is, while the crisis is not, um, or rather the current context rather, is not the only reason why we have the crisis. But what is it that we expect from people being systematically dispossessed and do not have political power? What happens when people no longer matter to capitalism as we see in South Africa with the mass unemployment? And what happens when ratings agencies tell us that the current uh, context does not necessarily you know, bother them so much and that in fact, it will not necessarily have a significant impact on the economy? There is a disconnect between what is seen of a financialized economy versus what is real on the ground and the desperation. In the midst of the crisis, caregivers, mainly women, have been excluded from the social relief distress grant. I think Nelson Mandela would particularly not approve of this gendered injustice. After all, he did say, and I quote, as long as women are bound by poverty and as long as they are looked down upon, human rights will lack substance, end quote. He did, after all, under his leadership, it was when we saw the gender responsive budget in South Africa, or consideration of gender responsive budgeting in South Africa begin. Yet, since the 90s, we've seen a recession in gender responsiveness in our macroeconomic policies. The list goes on, but I want to end on this to say that the austerity approach that we currently see will only exacerbate the social distress in our country to say that we need emergency rescue measures in our context, that the state must do what it takes to ensure that people have right to dignity, have right to food, have right to education, health, and all the rights that have been outlined in the constitution itself. And also to say that this moment also calls for us to reimagine or a reinstatement of the Freedom Charter process. What I love most about the Freedom Charter process was that it included a mass consultation of the people of South Africa. When people are feeling dispossessed and feel that they do not have political power, you will see social distress. So I want to plead to the NC to say that in paving our way forward, we need to think about what does the Freedom Charter mean today, or how do we reinstate a Freedom Charter today that responds to the needs of today, one that answers the economic question, and one that says that the current macroeconomic framework will not work. So what will? What will change the needle? Or what will shift the needle so that we do not reproduce the economic violence that has reigned on South Africans, even with democracy? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Busi Sebeko. That was certainly quite pointed straight to the point. What does the Freedom Charter mean for us today? Um, what are we saying about land, a living wage, a shorter way, working week? Um, we must change the structure of our economy. Uh, what do we expect of people who are 
unemployed and poor uh, and feel they no longer matter to capitalism, a gender responsive budget, austerity will exacerbate what we are seeing today and we must reinstate a mass consultation process of all our people to find out what their needs and what they want. Thank you very much. Uh, may I check if uh, Professor Samadoda Fikeni has joined us? Yes, I have. Good evening. Please um, uh, go ahead and take the platform. Well, thank you very much. And also I'm really appreciative of the invitation and honored, especially on this day. And I would like to also uh, greet fellow panelists and the audience. The most important thing to me at this time when we honor an, a global icon and a global statesman is about leadership especially your value-based leadership of Nelson Mandela. He is a leader who knew when to go to war. He is a leader who identified the moment of peace. He is a leader who knew when to forgive, no matter what incon I mean, inconvenience he had suffered as a person, he worked on those and try to make sure that he doesn't do what Martin Luther King Jr. say, drinking from the cup of bitterness. And he's a leader who knew when to leave the stage when he was still popular. But most important though, was the resolute decisive leadership, especially in the time of crisis will always remember the moment when the country was on the verge of being plunged into a civil strife and Chris Ani, a very popular leader had been killed. He took the stage, he says the moment. That's why many people say at that particular moment, he became a leader of the country, even before elections themselves. So that decisiveness, that ability at times where he pronounced on certain things such as laying down arms at the time when it was not popular because for him, it was not popularity. It was not to be loved by everybody, but to be respected based on values. The moment we find ourselves in of a crisis needs precisely that not only from government leaders because the problem has become so compounded, but also from the ruling party, from the business community, from the civil society, from the leagues of the Congress, and from the tripartite alliance membership, I mean leadership to say, how can we emulate Madiba by being that decisive? There are studies which are showing some of the underlying challenges of our society. That among others being social inequality that in Lulamiti report consistently indicates which could be exploited in a manner that is destabilizing as we have seen recently. How then do we deal with such things? How do we build the state capacity because precisely the responses to the challenges we saw indicated what happens when a patronage system begin to weaken institutions of state where loyalty instead of competence is the key driver. Now when faced with a crisis of this nature, you end up with a situation of this nature but I would like to close by simply saying, most countries have pulled themselves out of their challenges by seizing the moment that a crisis is the best time to press a reset button. A crisis is not the time when you deal with incremental changes. It is the time when swift actions come. Most national dialogues, social compacts come about in the aftermath of a crisis and that's when countries do change the course and that's when impactful leadership written down in history come in 
There would be no Churchill without a Second World War. There would be no Martin Luther King Jr. without the civil rights crisis in the US. And there would be no Nelson Mandela, uh, Winnie Matik, Zella Mandela, and many other stalwarts like Uar Tambo, Bigo Sobukwe, if it was not the moment of crisis, he responded to it. But all this was based on values. And those values are the ones that are inscripted in our preamble of the constitution. They are not in any sectoral interest. They are precisely in that space. It is for that reason that we remember Madiba because he defined a moment by responding to an enemy that was seemingly impossible to surmount. Hence the world today still emulate his leadership because he knew when to fight, he knew when to lay down arms, he knew when to fight for social cohesion and reconciliation, and he knew when to leave the stage, when to do community work, and he even knew when he said, it is in your hands, that in his twilight years, the next generation would have to take the baton. So those are the lessons the leaders of today, including myself and yourself, because each one of us in the places where we are, we are leaders. The weakness we can ever make is to think that it's only the union building or it's only the Lutuli house, it's only some premier and so forth. Every one of us exercising our roles and trying to emulate a Madiba but at the same time, knowing that the best out of leadership comes when you complement the team effort with complementary strength. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Prof, once again. Um, very clear, uh, value-based leadership. We must know when to go to war. We must know the value of peace and when to forgive. We need resolute leadership respected leaders based on values? How, how do we emulate that decisiveness that Madiba had over many incidences? How to build state capacity? We need to go deeper into ensuring that we have competent competence that is a driver and not loyalty and patronage. And I think your bottom message is don't waste this crisis. This is when we should be able to have a national dialogue that may enable us to change course. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, it's now, uh, um, at, I would like very much now to call on Professor Vishwas Sadgar. I know that he did uh, log in and welcome him to the platform. Vish? Uh, thanks. Uh, good evening to everybody. And it's an honor to be here this evening. Um, the acclaimed uh, African scholar Mahmoud Mandani, who was uh, the Amin and other Asians in the early 70s, uh, has put out a very important book recently. It's titled The Settler No Native, The Making and Making of Permanent Minorities, which is relevant to our engagement this evening. Mandani lords the importance of non-racial relations in South Africa. Uh, more than most countries, he argues, um, that have experienced colonialism, the non-racial tradition in South Africa provides intellectual and political foundations to build a truly decolonial society. In his view, it provides the basis for a refusal of the divisions of apartheid, whether cultural, economic, and political. And basically, he affirms the radical non-racial tradition as the basis for a decolonial identity. Now, Nelson Mandela did not invent the non-racial tradition, but he was actually a product of it. And he made a very powerful contribution in his own terms, both theoretically and practically. The Mandela legacy is definitely part of the decolonial canon. If we look at Mandela's ideological formation, he shifted from an African nationalist to a revolutionary nationalist, and then to what I would call an emancipatory humanist. His emancipatory humanism was about an existential journey to confront the dehumanized subject about confronting the demon of racism in all of us. And Mandela was an exemplary example of the emancipatory human project. Um, he, was, he was not God, uh, he was not perfect, 
Uh, but he has, if you like, provided us with a very, very powerful example of the decolonial self in how he embraced all races. Now, non-racialism as it exists at different levels in South Africa um, is formal uh, in our constitution, as we know that. Uh, it is also part of a people's uh, lived experience uh, and history, but it is also something that is claimed by the AC led alliance. And tonight I want to say that it's very, very important in this moment for the ANC led alliance to take stock of its commitment to non racialism. From where I stand in South Africa, it seems that there is a big gap, a gap, a huge gulf, uh, if you like, there's distance between the ANC led alliance and this idea of non racialism. I think a hard process of introspection and reflection has to happen on this question. The decolonial Mandela is not just about radical non-racialism as decolonial scholar Sabelo and Levo Gacheni shows us through his reading of Mandela's life and legacy. Mandela represents a antithesis to the paradigm of war, of war, an alternative to the imperial colonial apartheid paradigm of war. And Mandela said in the Rivonia trial, I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities, he said. It is an ideal for which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it's an idea for which I'm prepared to die. The quote is on our constitutional court wall. But Mandela's life shifts uh, from, from a guerrilla fighter to an agent of the paradigm of peace. And he didn't abandon his principles in that shift. And I would argue that even if he didn't receive the Nobel Prize for peace, he would have still been a champion of the of peace based on democracy, human rights, racial reconciliation, and emancipated humanism. Now, it is this paradigm um, that clashed even with uh, Sunny Abacha and the generals in Nigeria. And, and Mandela was accused of being very naive in his international relations, promoting a human rights approach. But he was a trailblazer and the architecture, the global architecture of human rights have evolved in our power structure. The Rome Statute was adopted in 1998, which provides for the International Criminal Court. It provides for redress against crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes or crimes of aggression. Now in the legal opinion we solicited over the past few days, given the situation in the country, I'm here tonight to tell the president, please do not rescind or unplug it. President Zuma did make moves in this regard. I have also come here tonight to say to the president that uh, I'm not demanding that his government pursue these issues because we were fortunate in averting an orchestrated race war in the country. Now, many communities were under siege over the past few days, but the Indian community in particular was under siege because of its Indian identity. It faced a racialized onslaught that could have led to genocide violence in a context of extremely toxic constitutional rights of Indians in these communities. It also failed to guarantee the rights of African people. Now, many of these historically Indian communities became cauldrons of fear, suspicion, and defensiveness. Now, it's clear, you know, the national liberation movement and history uh, is something that the Indian community has a place in, but I'm not going to repeat it here tonight because personally, and this is my cynicism, I think it doesn't have any value anymore. But I think in terms of us having a modern constitutional democracy, what happened over the recent period is unacceptable. I want to propose um, that we need to think about a just peace and we need to think about a non-racial peace. I fully support the investigations into the murders in Phoenix. I think those responsible for killing must be held accountable. However, that is not enough. I would like to argue and propose that consideration be given to resourcing and giving a mandate to the Human Rights Commission to pursue an inquiry into what happened in KwaZulu-Natal between African and Indian peoples. This has to be a mandate to pursue a just and a non-racial peace building agenda. The Human Rights Commission should go to all hotspot communities now and start such a process of inquiry, of dialogue, and make recommendations to Parliament for a just and non-racial peace-building agenda. This is consistent with the Mandela peace paradigm. There are several narratives swirling around this complex historical moment. My own view is that the unfolding mass-scale violence we all witnessed was an expression of a deep social or socio-ecological crisis in our society. And here I'm echoing what other speakers have said. 
Mr. President, you preside over and lead an unviable and desperate society. This has been in the making for two and a half decades. I'm not going to uh, repeat the data on this, but critical social science firms, there's a direct relationship between inequality, social polarization, and crisis. I don't have time to go into examples, but President Joe Biden in his inaugural address used a framing of multiple crises facing American society. What the president was doing was evoking critical social science. And based on that analysis, he committed and has advanced a consistent agenda to build an inclusive society, which even includes tackling wealth and income disparities. South Africa is facing multiple crises, climate shocks, pandemic, economic crisis, worsening crisis of democracy. Nelson Mandela faced a crisis-ridden society and was clear in terms of his paradigm of peace that he was committed to that these need to be addressed through building an inclusive society. Here, the Freedom Charter stands out, the Reconstruction and Development Program, but most importantly, the idea of street committees in his, in his autobiography. So the notion of deepening democracy is very, very important. I want to, I want to conclude with, with, with three other quick ideas. Uh, in the context of the, the food crisis in South Africa, the state response and the Solidarity Fund response has failed dismally. The magnitude of the crisis on the ground is big. And I want to suggest here tonight that we think about democratizing the disaster management uh, framework response to the hunger crisis in the country. We've argued for this over a year and a half. Uh, and it's important to do this in an inclusive way. The act provides for this, to bring in civil society, to bring in aid organizations, including uh, business, if they want to be part of all of this. So that's the first proposal. The second proposal is around food sovereignty pathways. We've been translating and working with this idea throughout the drought over the past seven years. We saw our food system collapse. We saw our food system take a hit now. It doesn't feed most, actually it doesn't feed 14 million people in the country and 30 million in food stress. Food sovereignty is really about us uh, building systems to feed our communities, villages, towns, and cities. And it's time has come. The world we are going into of multiple crises reads a fundamental paradigm shift in how we think about food. Um, uh, Isabel's covered me on the basic income grant as well as the editorial in the Sunday Times today, today. But just to say that we've done technical work on the UBIG. Uh, and the technical work says it can be fiscally neutral. It doesn't have to increase the debt to GDP ratio. And we're happy to sh we have shared that with government, but we're happy to share it uh, with anyone else that's willing to listen. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Sadgar. Key messages, um, the non-racialism that Madiba believed in, uh, he was a product of, uh, he was em an emancipatory humanist. We all need to confront the demon in ourselves. Um, Non-racialism is formalized in our constitution. However, the ANC must take stock to recommit or com of its commitment to non-racialism. There is a gulf um, and that needs to, we need to reflect and we need to uh, introspect on how we overcome that. Um, Madiba was a champion of peace um, <clears throat> and uh, 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 he, he espoused human rights as a key issue in his life. Um, we should really take stock and take heed of what happened in KwaZulu-Natal, a suggestion that the Human Rights Commission be asked to go to the ground and find out exactly what happened in those communities where um, some really serious problems had occurred. South Africa faces multiple crises. We need to build an inclusive society. We need to deepen our democracy. We need to deal with our food security and democratize the disaster management system that we have by bringing in um, civil society as well as uh, organizations or aid organizations and business if they so wish. And we need to look at how we can bring about food sover sovereignty uh, that would be enable us to feed our people wherever they may be. Um, thank you very much, Professor Sadgar. I'd now like to invite um, uh, Professor Monique Marx to take the platform. Hi, everybody, and um, uh, compatriots, fellow South Africans. Um, Comrades, um, 
very big thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I'm addressing everybody uh, from KwaZulu-Natal in a period of massive uncertainty, collective trauma and precariousness. This is perhaps the most somber Mandela Remembrance Day, yet also, as previous speakers have said, an opportunity to get the Mandela legacy back on track. I've tried very hard to think about what the Mandela legacy is, um, and we cannot claim that there's much material legacy. As we see all the time, the rise of inequality, multiple insecurities, and the devastation of infrastructure over a protracted period and reinforced in the past few days in what many have called a moment of insurrection. And so within the context of not being able to find a very significant material um, legacy <clears throat> since uh, the period of Mandela's government, I wanted to talk about what I thought uh, remains the legacy of Madiba. And in the process of talking about this, give some possible ideas for moving forward. Um, coming right now in Durban um, from a state of, of massive, massive trauma. The first that comes to mind, of course, is the forgiveness, uh, which is very much uh, who Madiba was. And, uh, and I think, in a way, the forgiveness that Madiba brought to South Africa was the greatest hope that many people had in terms of how we were going to go forward. Unfortunately, today, when we speak about forgiveness, it's mostly in religious terms. Yet what forgiveness really is, is about how we understand our relationship as human beings to one another. It is not, in my view, about our relationship to what we could refer to as God or a greater being. So to forgive, we need to have some degree of closure, some understanding of the truth of circumstances. We need to have an opportunity to acknowledge and to speak of the pain and the hurt and to have this recognized. And I think the three speakers before me have already mentioned that. It is talking this out. It is recognizing what is being real. It is seeing what is missing that is not happening currently. And so, in, in the consequence of that is that forgiveness remains elusive. And to follow on what Vish is speaking about, I think we see this mostly in relation to however we want to put it, um, whether we, we talk of it in race terms or not, but the, the divisions that exist particularly um, between what's called the Indian community and the so-called Black African community in South Africa. I hate using these terms, but I, I feel forced to. But there's a caveat to all of this that we need to hold on to. And that is that from my perspective, we see at the very micro level that there is human and interactions between South Africans that does show how we search for each other's humanity. And we do need to observe these micro inter interactions and we need to document these and we need to not disregard these. But we also need to find mechanisms and forums for what the feminist movement used to refer to as speaking bitterness. Experiences of dehumanization, discrimination, profound mistrust have to be vocalized. We do not need another truth commission, but we do need what I'm going to call platforms of truth at the most localized of levels. We need to be able to hear what is uncomfortable. Without some mechanism for forgiveness, we risk greater repressed grief and trauma. The outlet of these might continue to resemble what we have witnessed in KwaZulu-Natal and in Gauteng this past week. A second thing that I want to speak to is the notion of hope. Madiba dreamed hope into reality. Despair was never an option for Madiba and for the Mandela generations. And I, I think there are many generations. If we look at what has happened this week, although it is devastating, we do have hope. The hope is that, firstly, we did not give into insurrection. And I'm saying we as the South African community, the South African population at large. But there's other evidence of hope that has emerged. 
And we see this again at the localized levels where communities have mobilized in what historically we would have referred to as street committees, but now communities call neighborhood patrols. They have emerged organically, um, but I think in many, in many situations they, they have resulted from a historic memory of what street committees need to have, were, were used to do. But I think it's really important in this current situation to find ways to recognize what street committees and neighborhood patrols have been doing and to be very cautious about how the police engage with the people that have created and generated security at the local level in the absence of the state. We do also need to recognize that hope is precarious in the face of what I want to call the burden of the future. For many of our young people in particular, they stare at the burden of the future every single day. There are no life chances. There is no access to, um, to institutions of care and of progress. And there is no meaningful mechanism for being heard. And so my plea here is for us to speak less about the burdens of the past and more about the burdens of the future and to get a grip on what these are and how we can resolve them. As somebody who works on a daily basis with homeless people and particularly homeless people who have a drug use disorder, I see right every single moment of every single day what the burden of the future is. We cannot blame young people for, for example, becoming substance use, um, uh, using substances to, to dull the pain of their social reality, because the future really, really does not have much hope. And that needs to change really, really quickly. The final thing that I wanted to talk to in relation to the, the legacy of Madiba is the notion of healing. What we see in the events of the past week and of the ravaging impact of the global virus is that healing is yet to be achieved at all levels. We have relied too much on goodwill and too little on using a homeopathic term on what tinctures needed are needed to allow for a much deeper level of healing than just stitching up wounds. We have relied too much on this notion of South Africans as being resilient and not enough on the limits of our physical and emotional um, immunity, and there are very, very real limitations. Going forward, how do we keep the legacy of healing, of hope, and of forgiveness alive? Madiba dreamed of an Africa that was at peace with itself. And what we see now is a part of Africa, South Africa, which is declining rather than prospering. Going forward from today to reinforce what my colleagues and, and fellow presenters have said, we need a, a number of different things. Decisive leadership is incredibly, incredibly important. But what we need, I think, is integrity, transparency, and sacrifice. These are needed in all spheres of society, but particularly we need government to take a lead role in showing that they are actioning these principles. We do have a moment where leadership is desperately needed, as has already been said before, because this week will become a week that is written down as the moment before and the moment after. Integrity is about living to our morals, as Wissi has already said, our principles, our values. For many of us, particularly for Madiba, these were outlined in the Freedom Charter. Committing to these sets of values and principles leads to consistency. Consistency in turn leads to trust and trust generates hope and hope allows us to see beyond today. And I think there is no sense of where this integrity lies today. There's not a constant reinforcing of the principles on, by which this, uh, our country is currently being governed. Transparency is the second one that I want to talk about. Transparency provides confidence. It creates opportunities by giving us clarity. There is a move in South Africa towards greater transparency through the various commissions, uh, through the, the, 
the, the, the rule of law, which is now becoming much more evident. But we are paying a huge cost for this transparency in the short term. The cost that we are paying should not lead us to give up on the need to continue to be transparent. And I want to make some just two practical um, suggestions around transparency that is needed right now, this very moment, um, to pick up on the point about um, decisive uh, governance. What is needed is for us to know precisely how it is that government is going to secure this country going forward. And I think, Mr. President, it would be very important for you to stand up with members of the security cluster and give us a proper briefing around what the strategy of the security services is, defense, police, and intelligence in the coming weeks and going forward. I also think in the name of transparency, it's important to note that what we have going on, and I'm not sure in other parts of the country, but particularly in KwaZulu-Natal, is a lot of misinformation that's been spread through messages, uh, verbally and in videos and in various other forms, which are not verified. I'd like to suggest that in the immediate term, we have a line that is set up where people can send voice messages and find out if they can be verified or not. And if not, they need to be dismissed. And this needs to be happening on an ongoing basis. The last thing I want to speak about, and it resonates with my previous speakers, is, uh, is the notion of sacrifice. Sacrifice is giving up something that we value for the sake and consideration of others. Sacrifice, in my view, is the only way we are going to generate greater equality. And we've already had two speakers speaking about the need for the basic income grant. This is no longer negotiable. It is no longer something that we should be debating. It is an absolute imperative. We need to make the sacrifices to ensure that we can dream forward, that we do have hope, that we do have healing, and that we do have a sense of forgiveness in our country. We owe this to Madiba, but we also owe this to ourselves. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Monique, for quite a, a sobering input. Uh, Madiba's legacies of forgiveness, hope, healing, um, and sacrifice. Again, the theme of um, ensuring that we have a dialogue, but forums for people at a very localized level to understand what they believe is going on with themselves and with themselves and others. Um, and you say that the greatest hope is forgiveness, and that's perhaps one of the things we need to focus on fairly quickly. Um, you also uh, go into looking at the burden of the future um, for the young people of our country um, and making sure that we do that um, very speedily. You speak of transparency and call on the president and the uh, security cluster to provide the nation with what they will be doing in the next couple of weeks to secure the nation. Thank you very much. Um, it is now my honor to call, it is an honor for all of us to call Billy Ramachopa to the platform. Comrade Billy. Good evening, Comrade uh, President, Comrade Acting Secretary General, esteemed guests, and also fellow panelists. And I also want to thank you for this opportunity to participate at this very important occasion, the Nelson Mandela webinar. After all this battering that we have had from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the ugly events of last week, perhaps we need this moment, the moment of the Madiva magic. We are here celebrating a great man, a giant that lived in our lifetime and an embodiment of many of his generations and the struggles that they fought. A generation of selfless, upright men and women of integrity who sacrificed their precious, precious lives and families for the advancement of our national democratic struggle for a non-racial, non-sexist and non-exploitative society. They stood tall 
He stood for and lived and upheld the highest values and principles that place the people of South Africa at the center. As we reflect back, we remember a humble, honest, and selfless leader of stature and integrity who was able to unite all of us, black and white, during the very difficult moment as a nation and the world over. In, in, in delivering a hard on one democratic dispensation, this was a triumph over the oppressive, evil, cruel, and hated apartheid system that gave us the key to unlock and determine our own destiny and future for future generations. With the ball now in our hands, the choice remains ours to decide to either capitalize on that advantage or squander the chances at the hands of opportunists or enemies of our current democratic uh, uh, order. This occasion must be seen as a moment for both uh, introspection and reflection for all of us as a nation, the governing party in particular, and everyone else, of course. As we count on our gains and losses, it is quite evident that despite the solid foundation laid by Nelson Mandela and others, we still have a long way to go as a nation. Firstly, the rich and poor divide remains too wide. You know, leaving many millions of our people in abject poverty, unemployed, the high level of illiteracy is a real problem, poor access to health services. All these are serious backlogs that need our urgent attention as, a, as the ANC and also as a country. It, was, it is with that background that over the past few years, the unfortunate thing happened. We have experienced a serious onslaught on the state and the people of South Africa, which seeks to derail us as a, as a nation. First, we saw the rampant looting of the state resources, hampering service delivery. The painful BBS bank looting in Limpopo is a very sad story to keep going back to. The state-owned enterprises have been looted, some of them to the bare minimum so that they can no longer operate. And thousands of people have lost their jobs. Secondly, the deliberate weakening of uh, government departments, as we see it being revealed at the Zondo Commission, the weakening of the law enforcement agencies as well, the disrespect and attack on the judiciary, all are the problems that we are confronted with as we speak here today. The despicable and shameful criminal acts witnessed witness over the past week would suggest that we have somehow dropped the ball at the hands of opportunists who have, are having the upper hand, having given them an advantage to launch a desperate final attack on the state. Our democracy, the state, and, and its arms have been put under severe uh, stress. And so is the resolve, determination, and unity of the people of South Africa. Several observations are to be made from the sad scenario at play at this moment. The short-sighted opportunistic counter-revolutionary elements stooped very low and resorted to us and looting open defiance of even the COVID-19 regulations, damaging the critical infrastructure and businesses that provided the necessary livelihood for the very same people that they mobilized, the poor people that they took advantage of. All this apparently to assist, aimed at assisting an individual and one of us to circumvent justice and the rule of law. This we found to be very unacceptable, and as a nation, we should not. This should be a serious wake-up call for all of us, especially the governing party, the African National Congress. These heartless perpetrators of last week's events seek to undermine all of us as a nation. They're also undermining the foundations laid and democracy fought for by, by Nelson Mandela and the people of South Africa. We need to urgently and quickly set a, our country back on the right path of success and prosperity. 
the unity and the goodwill displaced by all South Africans during this crisis across the color, race, and creed is over this week of mayhem demonstrate that we can, as the people of South Africa, we can all and we can never be defeated. If we pull together, it seems like uh, troubles, crisis actually bring out the best out of us. The most serious message, you know, after all this is to our, the governing party, my party, the African National Congress. The broad church nature of our movement, the African National Congress is being exploited. This church is meant to unite all the people of South Africa for the purpose of reversing our painful past. But what we find happening is the reverse. It is that there are people that are holding us at ransom in the name of unity. It is not for the purposes of unity for convenience or a ladder to ascend into power and access state resources. For some people amongst us and few family members at the expense of the people of South Africa. The ANC needs to do a very serious introspection into our integrity, the values, principles that we all held so high, and even more important, the vows with the citizens of South Africa. Everyone is looking up to us for leadership. Should we fail, then would have failed the whole of South Africa and the whole nation. We need an honest and upright leadership for us to be able to cross the river Jordan. The question of the leadership needs to be addressed across all sections of society and all institutions, both in the public and private sector. And we need leadership that is uh, selfless, that is ethical, visionary, and it must be connected to the people. It cannot be caught with its pants down as it happened over this past. It has to be vigilant, and we need to be responsive to the needs and the cause of the people. Listen to those loud noises and the not so very loud noise. And we need to be action oriented. For the African National Congress, as I conclude, the long lasting agreed resolution of the renewal and will add as the SDG, the modernization of this important organization must be implemented with speed. If we don't renew, then we'll be left behind. Society will leave us behind. We need to modernize because now we live in a complex society and the problems are complex. And for that, we need solutions and people that will be up to, up to the game. In that, this process of renewal needs to be accelerated so that we ensure that the aims and objectives of this are rolled out throughout all the structures of the African National Congress in all the provinces. And we are the strategic dialogue group and other fraternal organization throughout the country. We are ready with the appropriate leadership leading, leading, leading us into the into action. As we redefine and re-oil ourselves and to remedy all the ills within our beloved organization, should we fail on this vital project, we'll soon be driven into oblivion and lose our position as a leader of society. And would have failed in delivering, uh, in, in, in delivering our mandate to the nation. I want to call on all of us, NC members, the leadership of the organization, that we cannot allow this movement and this country and our democracy to die in our hands. I thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Billy Ramahopa. Um, you took us through what the challenges are that we currently face, the looting, the weakening of the government, the weakening of law enforcement agencies, um, the rise of opportunists who have an upper hand has severely stressed our country. Um, we, and <clears throat> that our broad church is being taken advantage of we need to, your message is that we as the ANC need to accelerate our renewal project as well as modernize the ANC itself with speed so that we remain 
uh, in touch with what the people are saying and hear their voices and what their needs are. This is your message to us tonight, I hope that you also call for selfless, ethical and visionary leadership um, who can respond to the people and are of the people. Um, thank you very much to our panelists, panelists for those reflections on Madiba's legacy, as well as your insights into the current turmoil which our country is going through. The issues that you raise are wide ranging from socioeconomic factors, driving discontent, the security issues, the implications for our democracy and democratic institutions, issues of social cohesion and nation buildings, to the impact of the internal renewal issues of the ANC and how we dealt with these. More importantly, thank you for the constructive suggest suggestions on what we call as patriots and South Africans need to do. Indeed, our country does not have a, a shortage of thinkers who are able to, without fear and favor, give their analysis. We appreciate this. And even if we may differ with some points, we appreciate these inputs and perspectives. Comrade President, as the respondent in chief and keynote speaker on this occasion of the 2021 celebration of International Mandela Day, please, um, Take the platform. Thank you, <clears throat> Comrade Jesse Duarte, Deputy Secretary General of the African National Congress. Let me also extend my greetings to the leadership of the Alliance uh, partners and other components. But let me also especially thank the panelists who are participating in this webinar and who have brought a great deal of insight <clears throat> and have also provided some analysis, but more importantly have tabled a number of proposals of how we should deal with the issues that confront our people and our country. It is an honor to have this opportunity this evening to share some thoughts and also to respond to some of the proposals and thoughts that have been put forward by our panelists. As we celebrate the life of the icon of our nation, but also as we celebrate the legacy of Isitwalandwe, Siaparangwe, Nelson Kholitlasa Mandela, the former president of our movement and the first president of a democratic South Africa, and indeed the father of our nation. It continues to be a, a real privilege for us as South Africans to join many people around the world as we all commemorate Madiba's birthday following the United Nations General Assembly decision in 2010 to declare the 18th of July as Nelson Mandela International Day. I can't think of many people around the world who have such an honor of having their day celebrated globally. And I can't think of you know, many countries in the world that <clears throat> have the privilege of uh, having had someone as great as Nelson Mandela walking the streets of our country with us. And it is a real honor that we need to cherish as the people of South Africa, because not many countries and not many people around the world have this type of honor. The celebration of this International Day recognizes and gives credence to President Nelson Mandela's commitment to human rights, 
conflict resolution and reconciliation. It also gives us an opportunity for each one of us to dedicate 67 minutes <clears throat> on this special day to provide service to the people of our country through great and good deeds. And many people around the world did exactly that. <clears throat> and many people who did that, who set aside this time, are guided by Madiba's wise words that there can be no greater gift than that of giving one's time and energy to help others without expecting anything in return. Earlier today, I had the opportunity to be in Soweto to observe and join community members in the good deeds of cleaning up places that were recently trashed and destroyed following the outbreak of violence, destruction and looting. That is unprecedented in the history of democratic South Africa. It is clear now that the events of the past week were a deliberate, coordinated and well-planned attack on our democracy, <clears throat> on our economy, and our people's livelihoods. Faced with such events, President Mandela would remind us that despite the challenging times we find ourselves in, that we should keep our heads pointed towards the sun and keep our feet moving forward. He would encourage us never to give up or even to despair. And it's important that we should have that message from Madiba to guide us along the path of some of the challenges that we are facing. And he would be right in giving us that advice. We owe it to the legacy of President Mandela and all our brave forebears who sacrificed so much for our freedom to remain steadfast in the face of this planned, well-planned and coordinated attack on our nation. In addition to protecting our nation and our freedoms, all of us must continue to stand firm against efforts to divide us and that we must continue working together to renew aspects of how, yes, the governing party, the African National Congress, should function. And one of the greatest tributes we can pay Madiba is to renew and unite this organization that a number of you as panelists spoke about. The centerpiece of what the panelists were really saying is that there are two important things that need to be done. We need to strengthen the capacity of the state so that the state is able to address not only the security challenges that face our country, but also how the state is able to lead our country in ensuring that there is inclusive growth, that we address inequality, poverty, and unemployment. But also more importantly, how this state does keep true to the legacy of Madiba, and his commitment to the Freedom Charter. It was actually a very poignant moment when my sister said she prefers to remember the Nelson Mandela who committed himself to the Freedom Charter. Our young democracy and our movement 
the, well, the second aspect, apart from strengthening the state, is yes, to renew, to strengthen, and to unite the governing party, because it is the governing party that in many ways directs the fortunes of our country and therefore must be able to do precisely that. Because our young democracy and our movement are going through, at the moment, a very difficult time. Our survival as a constitutional democracy committed to the rule of law is under challenge. Very serious attempts were and continue to be made to instigate the unrest, insurrection against the government led by the governing party. We cannot say that similar attacks will not be attempted in future, nor can we say that those who seek to divide us will stop in their efforts. But we can say right now, in answering some of the issues that the panelists have, ra have raised, South Africans have shown their mettle. The response of our people gives us reason for optimism and to once again marvel at their spirit and their courage. And ensuring that they defend their democracy, but also much that has also been said here is to say, we want this governing party, this movement, to be strengthened so that it is able to play its important role. Now, the overwhelming majority of our people and structures and members have stood up and stood together and said, even as we face this crisis, that we will not allow this to rob us of the gains we have made in our democracy. Millions of our people have refused to be part of destroying people's livelihoods, people's lives, property, and our collective infrastructure. And I must say, that we are grateful for this type of reaction because the events of the past few days should not distract us from continuing to speed up the process of renewal of our movement. It is important for all of us to have a common understanding of what needs to be done to reunite and to renew this movement so that it can withstand this assault on our democracy, but also be able to execute the tasks of improving the lives of our people. And yes, making sure that what we've been facing over the past 27 years is addressed in a way that will take us forward. Developing a common understanding will also allow us to have a comprehensive response to the challenges before us. Now, as a movement, we've been dealing with the mandate that we were given by our last conference. And as an organization, we admitted that we had been having to deal with challenges that plagued us, divisions in our ranks, issues such as my brother Ramakopa spoke about, and decrying the current state of our movement. Also, the negative tendencies that have emerged, severely damaging the image of the ANC. And our standing in the eyes of the people, but also our weakening our ability to lead and to fundamentally transform our country. But that conference that I'm talking about 
resolve that our movement must restore its integrity, its standing, and it further committed to the people of South Africa that the ANC would do everything in its power to address the challenges it's facing, including corruption in both the public and the private sectors. And in keeping with the decisions of our conference to renew the ANC, we're making progress in living up to the decisions that were taken, discipline in the movement is being restored and being enforced. The work and decisions of our Integrity Commission are being followed up and are being implemented. And we are taking concrete steps to restore the values and the ethics and integrity of this movement that plays such a key role in the life of our country. And we are proceeding to implement long-standing resolutions aimed at, yes, eradicating corruption within our own ranks, but also beginning to deal with some of the social challenges that our people face. And as we do so, we're putting in place a stronger culture a stronger culture that will enable us indeed ensure that we renew this organization and that we instill accountability and organizational discipline to put in place this stronger culture of service to the people of our country and to revitalize ANC branches so that they are able to execute their tasks but also to be able to deal with the resistance that may be there to the renewal process. And some of the panelists spoke about healing, and yes, healing is also required in the ANC. At the moment, the response of our movement must firstly focus on returning calm and order to the affected communities and ensuring that this anarchy does not spread to the rest of the country. Members of the ANC and the Alliance have been integral to many of the community actions to stand against looting. And we commend community members and leaders, and I met a number of them today and the other day in KZN, today in Gauteng, in Soweto. It has been particularly heartening to see ANC and the Alliance out amongst our communities and leading all these efforts to restore calm and order. And we urge everybody to have these engagements that a number of our panelists also spoke about. Now, these engagements that have also to go beyond just dealing with the current crisis of unrest, and destruction, but also to deal with the pandemic that we are facing. Because during the course of this unrest, a number of people let their guard down. And going forward, our movement must drive a concrete pro program. Yes, to discourage looting and violence, but we must also make it clear that we need to adhere to the pandemic rules and regulations because this is still a present threat of this invincible enemy that we are facing. And we should do so in a participatory manner as we engage our people as a whole. This also means that our public representatives and ANC leaders, as it has been suggested even here, local level must be more proactive in, yes, being of service to our communities and also addressing issues that also go beyond the current situation, that also go beyond, yes, the pandemic, we must have capable and efficient public representatives and civil servants 
who are able to address the needs of our people because we have a duty to ensure that we are capable of serving the people of our country with distinction and that we should continue improving the way that we work for our people. Now, one of the tragic outcomes of this is uh, that violence that we face is the halting, slowing down of our vaccination program at a time when we now have, you know, more supply and uh, we're increasing the pace of vaccination. Now, the way this looting was happening was such that, as I said, it's likely to increase infections and we might see that manifesting itself as we move on forward. Now, a number of panelists have raised very important issues. And I particularly liked the suggestion that we should have Ubuntu 2021, maybe launch that. And that is something that obviously needs to be done in collaboration and cooperation with a number of role players, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, various other formations in our country so that it becomes a whole of society effort where we, we, we are able to say we now need to underpin everything that we are doing with the notion of Ubuntu. And that should be aimed at addressing all the needs that all the panelists addressed. Yes, addressing the issue of leadership, that this is the time when we must provide leadership. And the leadership, as my brother Somatota was saying, should not only reside in government, it should be also beyond government and engulf the country and get many of us to, yes, show this visionary leadership that will take our country forward in an Ubuntu type of way, where we put the interests of our people ahead of everything else. Because as a number of panelists were saying, some of the challenges that were exacerbated, not only by this unrest, but also by the pandemic, is the inequality, the poverty, and the suffering of our people. That this is the time when that leadership is required by all of us. The suggestions have been made that in addressing the needs of our people, we must be bold enough to think about interventions such as the basic income grant, a number of panelists mentioned this. Yes, it requires bravery. And some suggestions have also been made of where the money will come from. Now this matter is being given serious consideration. It is being discussed in the governing party. It is also being discussed at government level. It is a matter that is important <coughs> as it has also been raised by a number of uh, role players in our society. And I do believe that in giving serious consideration to it, we should also heed what our panelists uh, were saying uh, tonight. And I think what was also said is that this will validate, will validate our people and demonstrate that yes, some serious consideration is being given to their lives. And this matter will 
and is being addressed as we move on. And in many ways, it will also speak to what Nelson Mandela stood for, which a number of panelists said. His legacy was about caring for the people of our country. It was about how the Freedom Charter can be implemented. And we welcome that. And uh, so there's a great deal of reasoning that is being put forward. The pandemic, as well as the destruction that has taken place in the past few days, also means that we need to give practical support to our people. We need to give practical support as to small businesses that have lost everything to working people, both in our townships and in our rural areas. When I addressed the nation on Friday, I did say that these are matters that we are giving active consideration to, and we will be able to address them, including all the proposals that have been made uh, to us. And in doing so, we will do it to address all these challenges, the socioeconomic challenges that are faced by our people, because that is really the key. The grinding poverty that we continue to see in our country requires that we should address it. We need to address the structural inequality in our economy and make sure that it becomes more inclusive. Now, the initiatives outlined in the terms, in terms of the economic reconstruction and recovery plan speak to this imperative. And more of these have already begun you know, to, to be addressed. Other initiatives have however not shown the results yet that we would have expected. Unemployment, and particularly youth unemployment, has the potential to contribute to the social instability, and government must therefore focus on the issue of job creation and move much faster. This is a clear message that has come from our panelists, now, we are busy doing an assessment of the progress that we are making in terms of the ERRP, which will allow us to strengthen and adapt the aspects of that program as required, particularly at this moment, when the pandemic, but also the destruction that we have seen are wreaking a lot of havoc. And will he re, 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 read? Uh, uh, make a lot of havoc in the lives of our people. So we are required to speed up these processes and we will lead efforts to ensure that as we do this, we put the interests of our people in a better position. And a number of panelists said, this requires that as we address this, this uh, crisis, that we must now utilize to democratize issues such as the disaster management. Uh, we must ensure that there's food sovereignty and build really good systems that will include everyone and make sure that there is participatory involvement, but there should also be transparency. Yes, the issue of transparency was particularly raised when it comes to how we are going to ensure that we secure safety for the people of our country. 
this is an important aspect because our people require certainty about their safety. How security cluster in government will respond not only to this crisis, but on a medium and longer term basis to secure the safety of our people so that we can have what one of our panelists called just peace, but I would call it just safety. One of the key pillars of the Freedom Charter is, and Madiba himself, and the legacy he has left us, is non-racialism and how we should lead the process of non-racialism. And how in some quarters it's been seen that the ANC has not been placing enough emphasis on leading the project of non-racialism in our country. And this becomes particularly important as we see how and we listen to reports of increased racial tension and incidents of racial violence, especially in some parts of KZN. And we also observe efforts to fuel racial tension through social media and other platforms. And it is therefore important that the structures of our movement, and indeed, all of us must work to promote the fundamental value of non-racialism and inclusive societies, even at the worst of times. Whilst in the dock, Madiba stayed true to the values of non-racialism. He was clear that he fought against white domination and would fight against black domination. We must all strive to emulate his example and build one South African nation. Yes, of course, what has happened in Phoenix needs to be investigated. The human, it's been suggested that the Human Rights Commission must be asked to investigate the events that have also le led to loss of life and that has increased racial tension. And that is also the potential of through vigilantism, which we must not allow to take root in our country. And those opportunities or temptations must not be allowed at all. But we must also not participate in the spreading of fake news, as one of our panelists said, and messages that incite hate and spread prejudice and work. We must work to combat discrimination wherever we encounter it. And the suggestion was made that we should have pot possibly a portal that will deal with all these messages and ensure that those messages that are now being spread, voice notes, um, videos are dealt with in a way that they don't send panic amongst our people. What our country needs now at a time of crisis is a united, is that all of us must be united. All of us must ensure that our communities are not divided. And from the ANC point of view, which is the governing party, we must make sure that the ANC remains united and the ANC should be able to renew itself and make sure that it builds and continues to strengthen its structures to become vibrant centers of community organization and activism because the status, the strength, and the unity of the ANC has a huge bearing on our country as a whole. 
The ANC leads society, but in order for it to lead society, it must be united, but it must also be united on principles. And it must also address the failures and the misdeeds that have always prevailed, have often prevailed in the past. And this renewal must mean that the African National Congress, as panelist Ramukhopa was saying, must end patronage, must end corruption in all its manifestations. And we must develop committed and capable cadres capable who are fit for purpose to serve the people with integrity, humility, and distinction. And the renewal process must also mean that we must strengthen our non-racialism posture and non-sexism throughout our own organization and be able to lead the process of non-sexism and ridding our country of, patron, of, of patriarchy as well. But we must also be able to build a more youthful organization and embrace such things such as technology so as to address the unemployment that currently is a huge challenge to the young people of our country. Renewal must also mean that we enhance our people's confidence in our organization. And finally, renewal must mean that we unite the people of South Africa around the cause of building a better life for all. And building a better life for all would mean that we address all the various issues that have been raised tonight by our panelists. And I must say that the issues that were raised tonight are so relevant and they must be top of mind to all of us. Building state capacity to be able to ensure that we address the socioeconomic challenges that our country faces that we must be able to grow our economy and address also the immediate challenges so that these challenges we've been facing, and we've been facing these many challenges of poverty, unemployment over the past 27 years. And we must now re recommit ourselves and what I'm particularly grateful for is that both community activists, our intelligentsia, and various other panels who panelists who participated in this webinar are all united on what needs to be done. This goes beyond just giving people like myself as leaders in the African National Congress, but a number of others, a great food for direction into the future, that these are matters that need to be addressed. So I come out of this webinar enormously enriched, and we will work to return to being that leadership and the ANC that Madiba would be proud of. And we will make sure that we build a movement that is once again the first choice of the people of our country. And I'd like to end by quoting what Madiba said when he said, I am fundamentally an optimist. And he said 
whether that comes from nature or it's natured, I cannot say, he said. Part of being optimistic is keeping one's head pointed towards the sun. One's feet moving forward. And he went on to say, yes, there have been many dark moments when his own faith in humanity was sorely tested. But he says, I would not and could not give myself up to despair. That way lays defeat and death. And I'd like to say that I remain optimistic that the many challenges that we are facing of both a security nature, particularly in this current moment, we will be able to overcome. Of an economic nature, where we need to pointedly address the needs of our people, at an economic level to address the desperate situation that many of our people are facing at a socioeconomic level, we will be able to address them. And also be able to strengthen the capacity of the state. What has happened with the pandemic and what has happened in the past few days has shown up what I've often been talking about, about the capacity of the state. This moment gives us a great opportunity to reflect, but to act. To act in a way where we address and repair the incapacity that we have. This, these are problems that have been confronting us over a number of years. They didn't start yesterday. The pandemic and what has happened recently gives us now the platform, the urgency, and the capability of acting with greater speed. And that is why Madiba's quote about optimism is so instructive to me. But I know that we can only be able to do what needs to be done to strengthen and unite the governing party, to improve the capacity of the state, to address the needs of our people on a variety of issues, the poverty, the inequality, and all that we'll be able to address working together. These are challenges that we cannot be able to have one single person working alone to address. It requires a collective effort. And what I am heartened with is that all the panelists have spoken very, very strongly and vocally about the need to act together, to act together in a cooperative way. And I particularly like words such as, we must build platforms of truth, and sometimes hear the uncomfortable things, like I heard some of those tonight, but that with a measure of transparency, we must be able to address the challenges that lie ahead. Deputy Secretary General, I think tonight I walk away from this webinar more enriched and also with a more keener resolve to be able to address these challenges that face our people. I'd like to say thank you, and we've heard the message. We will heed it as we strengthen both our movement and also increase the capability of the government to address all these matters. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Comrade President Ramaphosa, for answering so well and so richly all the suggestions that have been made and uh, responding to the analysis and recommendations from today. And indeed, our theme for Mandela Month, which is we are all patriots, we are all one nation, does embody the legacy of Utata, our father of the nation. We've come to the end of a very rich program, which must be food for thought. Indeed, as a nation, we face all of these challenges and we do falter. But as Madiba said, it's not how many times you fall, it's how you rise. And it is time for us now to thank the Alliance partners, thank all the panelists, thank all the participants who've been with us um, throughout this uh, webinar. And we will be um, ending our, our evening and celebrate with a song, celebrate our hero by Joe Nina, Steve Kekana, Tepo Tolo and Bonolo with the kind permission of the producer, Tami Mchali.